Bienvenue au Comité Sénatorial Permanent des Affaires Sociales. And this is the Social Affairs, Science and Technology Committee. Toronto, I'm chair of the committee, and I'll ask uh, my colleagues uh, on the committee to introduce themselves. I'll start over on my right. I'm from Montreal, Quebec, and I'm deputy chair of the committee. Tony Dean, representing Ontario. Senatrice Rosemary Poilly, Nouveau Brunswick, bienvenue. Michael, over to you. Oh, hi. Uh, Mike Duffy from Prince Edward Island. And uh, Senator Duffy's replacing Senator Almadbar tonight. Okay. Marie-Françoise Mégy, Montréal, Québec. Chantal Petitclerc du Québec. So tonight uh, we are starting a three-meeting uh, week on the question of Canada's post-war adoption mandate for unmarried uh, mothers. Uh, we'll start tonight and then we'll tomorrow afternoon's regular scheduled meeting as well as Thursday morning's regular scheduled meeting, uh, both of them in committee room two, uh, will follow uh, to complete our study. Uh, tonight we have um, several witnesses, many of whom are, are mothers. They're noted on the uh, agenda as mothers. Uh, and there are three organizations. I just want to briefly mention who they are. Uh, uh, Origins Canada. It's an organization that helps to reunite individuals separated by adoption, as well as an organization that offers uh, support to those individuals affected, seeks acknowledgement of and accountability for unethical adoption practices and works with government to reform adoption policies through research and education. Uh, Parent Finders uh, Canada. Uh, it was founded in 1976. It's a national community-based organization of volunteers whose mission is to assist and support all members of the adoption community who are seeking reunion with family members. And then Adoption Support and Kinship, which comes out ASK as its acronym, is a Toronto-based organization that provides search and reunion assistance for individuals seeking their biological family. So we're going to start, uh, and under the umbrella of Origins Canada, I'll ask uh, Valerie Andrews, who is Executive Director, to start off, and you've all got seven minutes each, uh, and then we'll get into questions. Valerie? Thank you. I want to thank the Senators of the Committee for this study and for being here this evening. My name is Valerie Andrews. I'm the Executive Director of Origins Canada a federal non-profit organization providing support, resources, research, and education to those separated by adoption. We also assist governments and provide educational workshops for mental health professionals about adoption trauma. Origins was founded in Australia in 1995. In addition to my own experiences and those of all the courageous mothers and adoptees of Origins, my thesis on this topic informs the following. This is for Brian, Jennifer, and Janet. The Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 states that motherhood and childhood are entitled to special care and assistance, but that did not apply to the unmarried mother and her baby in post-war Canada. Many Canadians are unaware that in the immediate post-war decades, federal and provincial governments funded draconian adoption policies and practices that impacted unmarried mothers across Canada. This is being referred to by some scholars as the adoption mandate. My research shows that the mandate impacted over 300,000 unmarried mothers in Canada, many who were systematically and often violently separated from their babies by adoption. In post-war Canada, over 60 church-run and government-funded homes for unwed mothers were operated by mainstream Christian religion, including Catholic, Salvation Army, Anglican United and Presbyterian. Having to register with the social service agency prior to admittance, mothers were put on the adoption track. These were quasi and carceral settings where unmarried mothers were subjected to psychological coercive persuasion. Thaler Singer indicates that six systemic practices are required for the success of coercive psychological systems. A sense of powerlessness, control environment and time, keep a person unaware, use rewards and punishment to inhibit behavior reflecting former identity, and the same to promote the group's beliefs. Thus was the charged atmosphere of the maternity home in post-war Canada. Once placed there, it was unlikely that an unmarried mother would leave the experience with her baby. 
My research shows that in this, these facilities, adoption rates were about 95%. Surrender rates outside of these homes was also high, about 74%. This is in contrast to today where unmarried mothers surrender their babies for adoption at the rate of approximately 2%. In addition to the psychologically coercive environment women confined in these homes report being subjected to sexual, verbal, and emotional abuse. It is important to note that not all unmarried mothers resided in maternity homes. Some were sent to wage homes or had other arrangements. In Canadian hospitals, unmarried mothers report being subjected to verbal, physical, psychological abuse, punitive and harsh treatment. Most Canadian hospitals had protocols for the unmarried mother that were instigated upon her admittance. Mothers were left to labour alone. Some were over-medicated with psychotropic medications while others given no medications. Mothers were segregated from married mothers. The clean break protocol meant that babies were taken away while mothers were still in the final stages of delivery. Eye contact between mother and baby prevented by use of sheets, pillows, aversion of mirrors or other means. Some mothers report screaming and trying to run after their babies. Others report the use of restraints. Mothers were routinely denied their right to see, hold, or feed their babies. Without prior consent, mothers' breasts were bound and lactation suppressants administered. Male babies routinely circumcised without parental consent. Some mothers were even told their babies died only to learn years later their child had been adopted. There are still some mothers who do not know whether they delivered a boy or a girl being told, well, that's none of your affair. Current social work curricula embrace anti-oppressive policies, whereas my research reveals the profession as an unregulated unreg and less than anti-oppressive body with respect to the unwed mother in post-war Canada. The realistic plan, a social work euphemism for adoption was the casework solution for unmarried mothers. Mothers report the use of threats, fear, duress, lies, trickery, pressure, and even physical force to obtain uninformed consents with no legal counsel, most signing alone with perhaps a social worker or two in attendance. Mothers were purposely kept unaware of their legal rights as mothers. They were routinely not given a copy of any paper signed and usually not informed of their right of revocation. Social workers routinely withheld information about resources that might assist them in mothering, even to those who explicitly stated a desire to mother. Mothers were routinely told, you'll forget about this baby. One mother in origins being told by a social worker, it would be like losing a puppy. Mm -hmm. Mothers were returned to the community immediately after birth, still recovering from childbirth, in shock and traumatized from the harsh treatment and loss of their usually firstborn baby. Told to keep the secret, provided no counselling or aftercare. Then, these mothers were constructed as uncaring abandoners who chose adoption, unnatural mothers with no maternal sentiments who gave away their babies. These powerless, unsupported, resourceless, coerced mothers had no choice. I asked the mothers what they wanted me to say today. One said, we weren't given options or choices. Another, I lost the only child I ever gave birth to and I never recovered. And another said, I want my daughter to know she was always loved and wanted. It is the hope of many mothers and adoptees in Canada that this study will serve to illuminate, acknowledge, validate, and provide justice to those impacted by the adoption policies and practices, many of which were clearly illegal, unethical, and constituted human rights abuses at the time and not simply through the retrospective lens of today. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Well, that uh, gives us a lot to start with. And now we'll go to uh, uh, Sandra Charvey. Okay. Thank you, Senators of this committee, for the study and for being here tonight. I was pregnant 20 years old. Marriage was off. <clears throat> my parents <laughs> refused to have my baby and me at home. Um, I'd been self-supporting from 17 years old. Although many girls and women became pregnant before marriage, only those unsupported and not married were labeled negatively in social work theory, their sexuality and relationships under scrutiny. The trauma of an unsupported pregnancy for many young mothers disempowered them, leaving them vulnerable and defenseless against familial, systemic and societal oppression, exploitation and coercion. 
In April 1965, Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson promised $25 million a year to needy mothers and their children through Canada Assistance Plan. The social worker assured me I would have my baby. But when she knew I didn't have, oh my God, <laughs> I didn't have parental support, she began the process for adoption. I tried to explain my circumstances, but she said I must put the baby first. I was silenced. Unknown to me at the time, she withheld the resources available to me that would have enabled me to keep my baby with me. I was asked to pay in 1968 to stay in a maternity home. At the time, unknown to me, it was government funded for married mothers, unmarried mothers. The homes were isolating, isolating and uh, mirrored the authority that existed within the family, the church, social services, and society. Patriarchal authority was reenacted by the residence authority, male or female. Although many mothers had been attending school or university or had been in the workforce starting careers, the homes offered little more than an emphasis on domestic servitude. By the 1960s, most maternity homes had some arrangement for studies. I wasn't allowed to continue my correspondence courses, being told I was too old for school. Household chores, work in the kitchen, laundry, and bingo with seniors once a week. Uh, there were m meetings with social workers, mothers report being kept unaware of their rights and choices concerning their pregnancy. Also, they gave little information about labor, delivery, child welfare services, specifically resources that would assist them in mothering. For me, there was very little talk about beyond birth control, illegitimacy, and the benefits of adoption for my baby. Illegitimacy and the idealization of adoptive parents were two key components in promoting adoption to mothers. The best interests of the baby meant the baby was better off in an adoptive family. Social, social workers did not see unmarried mothers and their babies as a family, but as separate units. Unmarried mothers were seen as unfit to be mothers, and the baby would be given a chance in an adoptive family. Dr. Jeff Rickerby, Australia stated that the use of idealization of adoptive families in the best interests of the baby was pivotal to eliciting consents to adoption. I was told without proof it was best for my baby to have a mother and father. I wouldn't be able to educate him. <coughs> he would be illegitimate, ridiculed at school, and raised by a babysitter, intimating my baby would be better off without me. We were selfish to want our baby. They deserved a better life. We were expected to make the unselfish sacrifice for our babies to have the perfect life with awaiting adoptive parents. Adoptive parents could provide opportunities in life, illegitimacy erased. If we loved our babies, we'd, do, we'd put our babies first. In the homes, we were living in a vacuum, cut off from the outside world. We were hearing truths from the social workers and the sisters without proof. Heather Carlini stated ex-social workers had made statements at adoption conferences like, if you mothers out there think you were coerced into giving up your babies years ago, it's true, you were. They talk of quotas that they had to meet to keep their jobs, of coercion used to meet those goals, and of the shame they feel for their part in separating mothers and their newborns. We could choose our baby's religion, but the social worker might say, as was said to me, you don't want to limit your baby's chances of a good home, do you? The unsupported mothers deliberated about ad adoption with no alternative, alternative to compare it with. There was only adoption offered. The social workers knew we were trapped. Ann Petrie's research and interviews for unwed mothers' homes did not find one mother with a positive hospital experience. I wasn't given any medication. I spent my labor alone in an empty four-bed ward. In the delivery room before my doctor arrived, a nurse self-righteously berated me, letting me know her cruel opinion. I was powerless in the final stages of labor. My newborn <coughs> baby was taken away at birth. He now belonged to, oh, for heaven's sakes, to both social services and the hospital. I was holding my baby when the social worker arrived. Angry, she told me I hadn't been able to make a decision from the beginning. I, I was to meet her in the office in two days. Angrily, she said, you'd better not disappear. 
There were two social workers waiting for me with, with no one there to defend me against them. I, as I walked into the room, I, all I saw was their shoes. the hems of their garments. <laughs> Unmarried mothers were unable to defend themselves against the power of those in authority and in positions of supposed expertise. Well, the mothers were in diminished, uh, diminished capacity brought on by the physical crisis of labor, their dependency, and, an, and any extending, extenuating circumstances of birth the immediate loss of their babies and any drugs used prior to during, during or after birth. Prior to meeting with the social worker, there had been no information or preparation for what was to take place. During, there was little information giving, given. The social worker handed me a blank line form. I was told to write why I was surrendering my baby. I was stunned. They had taken my baby, only they knew where he was now. Two or three forms were slipped to me to sign without explanation. I only saw the place to sign. At that point, I didn't have the life experience to know what they were doing was wrong. I was totally numb. My baby was gone. The social worker stood in front of me. Coldly, she said, you will never see your baby again as long as you live. If you search for the baby, you will destroy his life and the life of his adopted parents. Sandra Jarvie, member of Origins. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, next, uh, we have Eugenia Powell, also a mother. Thank you. Thank you to the committee for inviting me here today. In 1963, at the age of 17, I was pregnant and unmarried. At the advice of our priest, I was sent to Humid House, a home for unwed mothers in Toronto. While there, I was told not to disclose my surname, not to name the father of my baby. I recall feeling like a non-entity, like I was invisible. I had no support and felt very lonely and frightened. Shame and sadness were constant companions. Upon receiving my files a few years ago from Children's Aid Society, it stated clearly that I had expressed a desire to mother my baby. This was no surprise to me. However, I was told in the home and by social workers that if I loved my baby, the best thing would be to surrender my baby to a married couple who would provide a better life. I was told that I would eventually get married and forget about my baby. How does a mother forget about her baby? The same thing was told to so many women during this time by social workers and maternity home matrons. This was pointed out by Michelle Landsberg in 1963 Toronto Star article where she states that at every maternity home and agency, one point is hammered home from the start. The baby must be given up for adoption. No one told me about the lifelong profound trauma I would suffer, e even though as I later learned social workers and maternity home matrons knew at that time that I would most likely suffer for the rest of my life. Social worker Diane Kemp stated at a conference of Ontario Association of Children's Aid Societies in 1966 that mothers would most likely mourn a lifetime. Many similar statements were made by maternity home matrons and social workers during that period, which are included in your package. When I left the home, I was returned to society told to keep the secret and carry on as if nothing had happened. There was no counseling or assistance provided to me. I was still recovering from birth, had just left hospital without my firstborn baby, having to pretend it never happened. The majority of mothers report that no counseling or aftercare was given to them. The Australian Senate inquiry found that the majority of mothers suffered from some form of mental health disorder following surrender. Studies show that over 82% of mothers <coughs> suffered a major depression in their life. Many suffer from symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety disorders, pathological grief, and other mental health disorders. Some mothers unable to cope turn to substance abuse to assuage their pain and suffering. Others lost their life to suicide. In Logan 1996, it was found 
that 21% of mothers had made attempts on their lives. Over 30% of mothers suffer from secondary infertility. Some mothers reporting that they did not feel worthy to be a mother after the shame of losing their child to adoption, while others were some, simply too traumatized to revisit pregnancy and childbirth. Like so many other mothers to the outside world, it may have appeared that I had gone on with my life, and in some ways I did. I became a registered nurse, got married, and had three more children. However, the profound pain and grief of losing my firstborn baby never left and often surfaced in the form of depression, anger, feelings of emptiness, and anxiety that affected those closest to me including my raised children. I became overprotective of my children and afraid to lose them. I continued to experience a deep emptiness in my life and keeping the secret as I was told to do took its toll. I have simply never recovered from the trauma of losing my baby. I unconsciously disassociated from these events in order to function. I continue to have a difficult time trusting others I also suffered from pathological grief, having continually grieved the loss of my firstborn my whole life. At 73 years old, I have come to realize that this pain will most likely stay with me for the rest of my life. My experience of lifelong pain and sadness is typical of mothers of adoption loss. The trauma suffered is also intergenerational. I am Ukrainian, and that heritage is important to me. My child was placed with evangelical Christian parents. My child lost her culture, her language, her ethnicity, and the difference in our religious views have complicated our reunion relationship. Even though I reunited with my daughter 26 years ago, and it seemed in the early years that we had formed a close relationship, I was never given the title grandmother, although I often took care of my grandchildren when they were young. These are my only grandchildren, and it hurts to the core of my being that I am not acknowledged as their grandmother. In November of last year, my first great-grandchild was born. I have seen her only once, and I am relegated to the margins of her life, always hoping for a picture or a visit and remain unacknowledged as a family member. I keep hoping that with time this will change, but increasingly have come to accept that it most probably won't, and the pain and suffering continues anew as I now try to follow my great-grandbaby's life. There are a few therapists that understand the issues of adoption trauma. Many mothers and adoptees report that they have to educate their therapists about this issue. And it is extremely difficult to find appropriate mental health services. The Australian Senate inquiry recommended that specialized counseling be provided to those impacted. At the very least, we ask this committee to recommend that funding be provided to further educate mental health professionals and to provide specialized counseling to those separated by adoption across Canada, something that was denied to us all those many years ago. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eugenia. Uh, on behalf of Parent Finders, Monica Byrne. Good evening. My name is Monica Byrne, and I'm the National Director of Parent Finders of Canada. You see here four of us who are mothers. These are the women that I have dealt with for many, many years, and an adoptee at this end. The Parent Finders Organization began in 1974 in Vancouver as a group of adult adoptees. By the 1990s, there were more than 26 branches in the country. In almost every large town, there was a Parent Finder group. The world of adoption was private, secret, closed, and unacknowledged, and searching for origins was a new phenomenon. Birth parents and relatives soon joined our membership in every province, and adoption records were closed all across the country, and little of information was available. Adoption is part 
of the very tapestry of Canadian life. It crosses all social and cultural lines. Most families are touched by adoption somewhere. Adoption can and should be a good and loving solution to the historic social problem of children who need to be parented. However, and adoption was seen as the perfect win-win situation and solution for the problems of all members of the adoption triangle. But many of our practices in Canada have been downright negative, in particular for mothers, the mothers of these babies. I joined Parent Finders in 1986 when I learned that adoption records were closed. I'd been listening to Peter Zofsky on the radio interviewing P.D. James, the murder mystery writer, and she was talking about how records in England were open, and he said, oh, I don't think they're open here. I remember this very clearly, nine o'clock in the morning. And uh, I was assured, sorry, this ran totally contrary to what I had been told by social workers in 1966 when I, as an unwed mother of 20, I was forced to relinquish my daughter. I was assured that when she was 18, I could find her again. Until then, I was told I should go home and get on with my life and be a good girl. I remember the judge saying that to me in the court, be a good girl. In 1986, now married with three young children, I went to Children's Aid in Ottawa to ask about a reunion. And of course, I was told this was absolutely not possible. I was then forced to play private detective on my own and find my daughter. We have had an excellent reunion, and that's going back 30 years. She has two families who love her. This has been normal. I reached out to Parent Finders for help and have since volunteered with them for the last 32 years. During these many years, I have been involved both directly and indirectly with approximately 3,000 family reunions. Between birth parents and their adopted adult children, between siblings and even between grandparents and grandchildren, many people contact Parent Finders for search, support and advice. They receive all sorts of help and information, go on their way, and we never hear of the outcome of their search. Others keep in touch for years and years. I have people phoning them and they'll say, do you remember me? I called you in 1991. Uh, this is constant. I, I am, talk on the phone at least four or five times every day to adopted people and birth parents searching. It's a continuous thing. Many cases involve interprovincial adoptions. In Ottawa, for example, it was quite common for babies who were born in Ottawa to be adopted in Hull, now Gatineau, meaning two provinces, two different sets of adoption laws, two sets of chaotic situations. Much complexity. Requests for assistance come from International Social Services of Canada, from social service agencies in other countries, from indigenous Canadians from the baby scoop era, and from people who were born in Canada but adopted in the USA. Very common in the past, very common. S cases date for us from the 1930s to the present day. In the past, many social workers and psychologists have thought that digging into one's uh, origins if you were adopted or wanting to know about one's relinquished child showed a pathology, an obsessive inability to go, let go of the past. In some families, the need for professional care was recommended. I have brochures given to adoptive parents from the 60s saying that if your child wants to know his origins, you may wish to seek professional advice about this, that this is not normal behavior. The effects of reunion. I have been overwhelmed by the ultimate injustice of the system and the cruel and harsh treatment, particularly towards mothers. Not only did their families not support them, but neither did the agencies from which they sought help. In many cases, the treatment was downright punitive. The most common effect for the mothers of what I call, is what I call the deep freeze effect. The shutting down of all memory and emotion about the birth and the relinquishment. It is usually only much later, after a reunion with the lost person, that the mothers realize what has happened to them 
and like the Me Too movement, they come forward long after the fact. They recognize that the, that the treatment they received at the hands of the government agencies, social workers and family courts, and their own lifelong emotional damage should, not, should no longer be hidden. For many women, the reunion with the long lost child, now adult, is an awakening. All speak of the hole that has been filled somewhere in their heart. They stop searching for the lost child, a common preoccupation for mothers. They finally sleep at night. Reunions can remove the heavy emotional burden of guilt and lead to self-forgiveness. For many, it allows them to break the silence and talk with family. For many, there were no more children. This was their only firstborn. As already pointed out, the uh, percentage of women not conceiving again is between 30 and 36 percent. Very high. Very few therapists are trained to deal with birth mothers. All we mothers were told, you will forget the child, as you mentioned, go home, get married, and have other children, or if not, get a puppy to cuddle. That was what I was told, get a puppy. Always puppies. The reunion is a brief one-time event. The reconnection can take years before a normal relationship is formed. Sometimes this never happens. We don't always get along with all our relatives. Reconnection is a very complicated procedure of counseling, support, and advice in just plain time. This is where we at Parent Finders spend most of our energy and time. I can honestly say that I have never had anyone tell me they regretted embarking on this journey. They have found the truth, and that is what the journey was all about. In conclusion, I entered into this subject because the injustice of closed records and sealed files was abhorrent to me. But as I have dealt with all the players in this movement, the adoptees, the social workers, family members, one group has stood out as being the most hurt by this system, the mothers. They are a silent group, unwilling or unable to speak easily about their experiences, too closely attached to their shame and their pain. The reunion experience, like everything else in life, varies greatly. It was these stories that have empowered me for a very long time to do reunions and bring these women comfort and healing and now recognition. That harsh treatment and process these mothers endured was completely unacceptable by any standards ever, and a full recognition must be made to them. I attest and was witness to all of it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh some very powerful statements. Uh, finally, we have uh, Wendy Rowney, who is representative of Adoption Support Kinship. Thank you for inviting me here today to speak with you about closed secret adoption and how it impacts the person at its center, the adoptee. I have spent the last two decades listening to adopted adults talk about adoption and how it has impacted their lives. I served on the boards of the Adoption Council of Ontario the American Adoption Congress, the Coalition for Open Adoption Records, and as Vice President of the Adoption Council of Canada for almost a decade. Since the year 2000, I have provided support to adult adoptees and their parents by facilitating a Toronto-based support group. Adoption Support Kinship, or ASK, has met monthly for the last 18 years, and over that time, hundreds and hundreds of adoptees have walked through our doors seeking assistance, help, and reassurance. These are the children who were born to unmarried parents when this was socially unacceptable, and then adopted as infants in an era of absolute secrecy. They're all grown up now, mostly in their 40s and 50s. They have careers, they have families, they have well-rounded lives, and they also carry great pain and sadness with them. They speak of the absolute bewilderment that comes with never seeing themselves reflected in the people around them, of never knowing their ancestry. Mostly, however, they talk about loss, the loss of their families, their names, their ethnicities, their very identities. Adults weep as they mourn the loss of their mothers, young women who held them once and let them go, and the relationship they will never have with her. They also speak of deep love for their adoptive families, for the parents who loved them, raised them, and continue to provide them with emotional support. Everyone agrees that growing up in a loving home 
has no impact on their need to know their ancestry and the woman who gave them birth. You can love your parents and still need to know who you are. These are the issues that adoptees talk about when they are alone together. Not everyone feels all of these things, of course, and of those who do, their feelings change over time as the relationship with their families and adoption grows and stretches. Adoptees talk about these issues and I listen. I listen and I understand because I too am adopted. My mother was sent far away from her home when her family learned she was pregnant. She gave birth to me on a cold December day, three weeks before her 18th birthday. I saw her briefly, I am told, in the delivery room and then through a glass window when she identified me as the child she was reluctantly surrendering to adoption. She never hold me, held me, she said, because she knew if she did, she could never have let me go. I went to a different home where I grew up with loving parents. But I thought about her all the time, this other mother, whose absence was ever present in my life. I wondered about my ancestry. Who were these people whose blood flowed through my veins? I don't know how to explain to you what it is like not to know. I can tell you that this absence of knowledge is not a trivial thing. It is not something you get over or forget about. I long to know who my ancestors were and who my mother was. Was she like me? Was she different? Did she want me? When the mother of an infant dies, other adults gather around the grieving child and talk about the missing parent. Over time, they point out similarities between the two. They share stories and keep the mother alive in a child's memory. When a child loses a mother to adoption, the exact opposite occurs. No one mentions the missing mother. Her importance to the child goes unrecognized. From the child, child's point of view, however, both losses have a similar outcome. The mother is gone. In one instance, we expect the child to feel loss. In the other, we suggest there is something wrong with the child if she feels the absence of her missing mother. I can't think of another instance in which we expect the loss of a mother to be met with total indifference. Trying to reconcile the deep feelings of loss with the societal expectation that their original family is irrelevant creates a sense of profound confusion in many adoptees. They feel one way, but know they aren't supposed to. This confusion can create a sense of isolation. Why am I the only adoptee to feel this way, they ask themselves. In turn, this often leads to guilt. I shouldn't feel this way. I should be grateful for what I have. At the center of all of these mixed up feelings, however, is loss. Loss of family, loss of name, loss of ethnicity, loss of identity. When we stop and think about it, we realize that loss is an appropriate reaction in this instance. When humans lose something important, they experience loss. For some adoptees, this sense of loss permeated their childhood. For others, it is not something they feel until they meet their lost family. Still, other adoptees experience none of this. Not everyone has the same reaction to a similar series of events. Some adoptees do not experience genetic bewilderment or feel a sense of loss, but this neither negates nor invalidates the experience of those who do. And after two decades of listening to adoptees, it is clear to me that there are many, many, many Canadians whose lived experience reflects what I've been describing today. Unfortunately, these are little known facts outside of the adoption community. It seems to me that there are a lot of assumptions about adoption. In our society, we believe adoption builds families, but we ignore the fact that first another family needs to be destroyed. We trust that the adoption child blends into the family so completely that he never questions his past. But we forget that thousands of genealogists wonder about their own ancestors. We say that adoptees do not feel the loss of their original mothers, but we overlook the fact that this rule about who humans can or cannot miss only applies to adoption. We assume adoptees are grateful to be adopted into a loving home and feel indifferent about receiving a new name and identity, but we never ask them how they feel. I am here today to say that we are not indifferent. We care very deeply. 
Many of us will say that we love the parents who raised us, but we grieve the loss of the parents who created us. We will say that we recognize our place on our adoptive family's trees, but know that we have our own tree and we need that to be accepted too. I urge you to listen carefully to what adoptees are saying and understand that adoption is not a one-time event in the life of an adoptee. It is something that impacts and influences our entire lives. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, to all of you for those, those presentations. And now, uh, committee members will uh, ask questions. I'm going to uh, start with the deputy chairs, uh, Senator Seidman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I have to thank you all so very much for coming in here tonight and sharing your stories with us because it's clear that they're not easy for yourselves to present to us. The emotion is very evident. And I think our emotional response, you know, I can feel it in the room. So it's tough. And, um, and I really appreciate, I know we all appreciate um, your courage in, in coming and sharing with us. Um, and, and I must say, I'm myself, as I think you said, um, Ms. Byrne, um, in your presentation, uh, that you were overwhelmed by the ultimate injustice of the system and the cruel and harsh treatment, particularly towards the mothers. I must say, I am rather overwhelmed myself. Um, and, I mean, I grew up in an era where, you know, I, I do recall hearing whispers of, you know, young girls in school with me who would just disappear um, and never return. Um, but what I'm struck by listening to all of you this evening is this sort of sense of a systemic conspiracy. And, and I'm trying to understand that, and, and I'm wondering um, why. So there are governments involved um, in providing money um, to adoption agencies. Um, I, I, I wonder if perhaps Ms. Byrne um, or Ms. Powell, if you can help me <clears throat> Um, no, I don't. I, I think I'm asking perhaps the wrong person, but maybe you could, Ms. Powell. But I'm wondering if you can help me understand um, how you under how you understand this this thing that happened that is so dreadful. Okay, I'm going to, I'll start since you mentioned uh, Ms. Byrne yep. and Ms. Powell. I'll start with them, and then anybody else that wants to come in who has something to add, not to repeat, but something to add, please put your hand up and let me know. Okay, let's start with Monica Byrne. It's very hard to put oneself back in another time and into another mindset. And we know that there were certain practices, I mean, we don't flog people anymore, and we don't do all sorts of nasty things, but this was a little different. There was something around how the mothers were treated. It was, it was as though they had gone beyond the pale, and the pale being the palisade around society, and they had sinned, I know for a fact, that, uh, you know, in, in the province of Quebec, there was a great deal of stuff around sin, and many good Catholic girls didn't get pregnant, and if they did, there was a habit in Quebec of changing the names of the children and giving them a nom fictif, which was a fictitious name, so that if you were born on that, uh, many babies born on a Monday would be La Plante, and on Tuesday, La Porte, and on Wednesday, they'd, they'd give the mother a fake name, and then the baby would be born under a fake name, which to me is unthinkable by today's standards. And how it was, I don't know, I don't know the answer to your question. I don't know how people justified it, other than making it somehow a matter of sin, or, of, of, of how we viewed an unwed mother, a fallen woman. We called these babies bastards. We called them illegitimate. We called the women fallen women. We had names for them. I mean, it was a very punitive kind of behavior towards these women. And the trouble is that it doesn't go away. And as we attest, all of us, 
the effects are lifelong. And in this, this is why it needs to be recognized that this was not a good pattern of behavior. It may have been the way it was, just as I, I used to say to people, we wore stockings with seams up the back, we wore girdles, we had different lifestyle. People, you know, talked about stealing a kiss. And I think now, with the Me Too generation, you try and steal a kiss and see what happens. You know, it, it wouldn't happen. But nevertheless, the behavior is abhorrent and it should be recognized. What I recall is there was just so much shame around me being pregnant. I was sent away. And I can recall that shame to this day. I can recall how my mother reacted. And it was just unreal. When she found out I was pregnant, she beat me. And it was just, I, I just can't imagine doing that. It was just beyond anything. And I was sent away. And there were, at that time, there were a lot of people that were wanting to adopt babies. White, white, blonde, blue-eyed babies. Only my baby had brown hair. <laughs> but um, there were a lot of people out there that were wanting to adopt babies. And so there was a supply and demand. And that's what happened. Valerie Anders? Um, in my research, um, my thesis is entitled The Adoption Mandate, and, and uh, I look at it as a perfect storm of things that happened post-World War II. It was a time of the mother imperative. We, the women who had been working in the war were sent back to the home. They were to be uh, mothers. We were in the baby boom. We were, you know, those kind of things were happening. And that mother imperative, um, you know, was affected those women who could not have children as well. Um, there were sociological ideas that were coming forth post-World War II about attachment to children, like Bowlby's attachment theory, theory and Lorenz and all those different theories that were coming out at that time about children and attachment. There were the psychoanalytical theories. The unwed mother was ill. This is the most important thing we need to know, that at that time, the unwed mother was considered psychologically ill. Like, what kind of, what woman would do that? She, she has to be sick. And there's, um, you know, I have tremendous amounts of research and quotations which I've given you in your packages that you, if you just read the quotations in your packages, you'll get a very good sense of what the experts were thinking at the time, which was that we were sick, we were ill, and that, um, you know, we didn't deserve to have our babies. We were unfit by virtue of the fact that we were unwed. We, you know, and a lot of people get mixed up with, um, uh, you know, child welfare and, and, and you know, losing a child to it. Oh, they were, you know, maybe there were something, something must be there. No, this was simply because we were unmarried. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that we posed any harm to our children, of course not. We, we were unwed, therefore unfit, and we were ill. And because of these sociological, psychoanalytical theories and this post-war mother imperative coming together with new ways to separate babies, baby formula, a way to separate a baby from its mother. There were a lot of things going on at that time, which I say created this perfect storm, where we saw en masse mothers, you know, surrendering babies for adoption. And the, you know, the governments liked it because they wouldn't have to support and help mothers and babies. <coughs> Uh, once a child is adopted, they're off the welfare rolls or they're off the government purse. And so that was all part of it as well. But I think the mother imperative and, and you know, just the, that part of it was a, was a big factor. Can I say something? Uh, let me, let me first of all say. go to Sandra, Jeremy, and then I'll come back okay. to you. 
We'll, we'll get everybody in here, but please keep it brief because we have to get on with a lot of other sure. questions. Uh, I'll just make mine brief because um, I was 20, 21 when my baby was born. When I went to social services, she knew what my circumstances to the bit. She didn't want to hear after that. But they withheld. I didn't know there was money, and I was in a situation where I was temporarily without money. And, of course, being pregnant, I wasn't going to be working much longer. And so they took, started the adoption process. I didn't know there were resources at all. And they started right that first time. And then when I went into the home, um, it was all, if a social worker, when they come, was talking about illegitimacy and adoption and what was best for my baby, right from the top. And I had no idea and no way of knowing, there's no internet or anything, that there were resources. And the only reason I was there was that I had been abandoned by my family, but that I didn't know there were any resources. So I had no money, so I couldn't leave, and I was trapped in there. And then when it came down to the surrender, I, I just thought they were taking my baby because I didn't have any money. And when I went into the office the, the last time, they switched. Now, I'm telling you this from, I didn't know at the time, but all I was shocked that I was now signing a paper. I didn't think I had anything to do with it. So what they did was, it was a setup as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Am I yelling? Uh, no. Let me go back for a moment to Monica Byrne. Mothers not being thought to be mentally fit. Uh, many agencies in the 50s and 60s psychologically tested the mothers before the children were placed for adoption in case, you know, this woman had had a baby out of wedlock. She may be not normal. And then the children were tested as well. I have this, you know, I, they report this to me, the mothers, that they were psychologically tested. and. You asked before, how could this happen? How could it happen that a woman would be asked to deliver a baby with a bag over her head, lest she see the child? I, I, I don't understand it, to be quite honest, except to say that it was disgraceful. OK, let me go to Senator, uh, Senator Penny Clare. Merci, monsieur. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to ask my questions in French. I'd like to thank you first for the, the stories that you've shared with us so generously, which are troublesome, but they're so essential and important for us to hear. I'm trying to understand, and I'm going to continue on the lines of the question of uh, my colleague, perhaps I go a bit further, because quite honestly, when I started to read, I see, I see a bit. Let me continue um, in English while we do that. Um, when I started to read, um, is it working? Canal Anglais, one, two, three. Est-ce que vous attendez Canal Anglais, English Channel? Can you hear English Channel? One, two, three. Wait, oui, désolé. Okay. So I'd like I'd, I'd just like to thank you very warmly for your generous stories and your important testimony that you're providing us today. And I just want to continue on along with the question that my colleague was asking you, because when I started to read all of this and read your testimony, my first thought was that these are kind of isolated stories that are part of a certain time period or a religion. But now I'm wondering, um, Senator, uh, sorry, Ms. Andrews, perhaps you have an answer that you've attained through your research in terms of what you've learned and researched. Were governments in involved? Were they just observers, or were, were they deliberately involved in, in the organization of this? I'm trying to understand the role and the responsibility of the various levels of government at the time. Um, uh, governments were involved, and um, 
certainly in the funding of maternity homes through the Canada Assistance Plan, they're specifically stated as, um, you know, they're specifically named that they should be funded by the Canada Assistance Plan. Um, provincial governments, obviously, um, you know, because, you know, adoption generally is, is handed down through the, the provinces. But um, certainly provincial governments were involved. And in fact, in my research shows in Ontario that, um, you know, I have one, one piece that's very interesting where um, the adoption coordinator of the province of Ontario was in one of these maternity homes and saying these women don't seem to know anything about anything. Should we make a booklet for their rights? And um, the ministry resp responded, absolutely not. So yes, governments were very much involved and understood what was going on. And in fact, uh, many, many, many children left Canada, lost their uh, citizenship, were adopted out of the country, uh, where federal uh, government uh, agencies uh, provided their passports, looked after all of that. Um, uh, you know, other government, uh, certainly municipal governments, at every level we saw, uh, we saw that. Social workers, depending on which province, of course, like in the province of Ontario, there's something like 50 different children's aid societies that, that you know, hand down these services, whereas in BC, it's done directly by the government. Uh, um, but certainly, whichever province you were in, um, you know, these were the social work policies and the social workers were uh, the um, employees of, you know, um, various provincial governments and so on. They were the child welfare people. And they, it, they were in a, a conflict of interest because they were handling not only the adoptions, uh, you know, the facilitating the adoptions, but getting the babies from the mothers. It was just a whole, I know it sounds like a conspiratorial thing, but when you look at the actual research and you see that, you know, that is exactly what was going on. That was quick, so you can get another question in. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I think I do know the answer to that question, but I just kind of want it to, on the record. The way I understand it, um, isolation is, is one word, you know, listening to your story is, is uh, you are, uh, or, you know, the mother were, uh, obviously very vulnerable at a time of their life where they needed all the support that they could have. And whether it is from the family, the social worker, or anybody involved, um, it was a lot of isolation. And, and I'm, I'm trying to, uh, and, and you did mention it, so the way I, I, I read it and heard it is there, there was no uh, help in terms of making, you know, when you were signing those papers, clearly, like, they didn't call your parents to ask, or the father, or anybody, you know? Uh, it's, it's just a small detail, but I find it very, um, well, wrong, but I just kind of want to, uh, I guess, make sure I understood that right, I that you did not have anybody mm -hmm. helping you make that decision, or, or not make that decision. I can speak to that. Okay. Uh, I went to family court here in Ottawa on mm -hmm. Sunnyside and Bronson and the judge, uh, uh, when I walked in the door, I'm 20 years old, so I'm under 21, and the, I was told at the door by the social worker, you have to have a legal guardian, we have given you a legal guardian. I'd never met this man in my life. I was taken into a side room and I remember him sitting in front of me and he said, you have no option. You need to sign these papers. I am your guardian and I'm telling you what you have to do. And that was it. And I went into court and the judge looked at me over his glasses. I remember that. Judge Good. And he said, what is a nice young girl like you doing in a court like this? And then he said, go home and be a good girl. That was, that was the end. That was me signing the papers. No, I was not told I, the, the, that I could change my mind. I was not told my legal rights. None of that. So, I think you're all saying that pretty well. Valerie Andrews, you want uh, to add Just briefly, most, 
Most women did not have to go to court. Most were signing and social service agencies in an office, maybe with a social worker or two present. No legal counsel. I haven't met any mothers that were given copies of anything they signed. They came away with no piece of paper to even say that this happened to them. So they had no proof of the, of the event. Um, mothers were not um, uh, apprised of their right of revocation in, in different provinces. It was either 30 days or 20 days or 21 days where you had a right to change your mind and mothers were not apprised of these. Myself, I was in a room with three social workers and I was very reluctant because I had expressed a desire to mother my baby. And um, I was, and they, they were, you know, go ahead, um, it'll be better, it'll be better for him. It'll, you know, it was always using your love for your baby to, to coerce a mother, to say, well, if you love your baby, then. That, that was the message. And so for myself, that's where I was, a 17-year-old girl with three social workers, no legal counsel. Of course, parents were not included. Because even at 15 and 14, even today, a mother is, is legally able to sign those papers without any kind of um, legal counsel or, or assistance. Okay, Therese uh, Meiji. Next, Mr. Thank you, Chair. I'll ask my question in French. Uh, is your head uh, piece work, your piece working? Yes. Thank you for your testimony. It's quite touching. I know it, you're around the same time period, and you've all said you are no longer able to uh, see your children, and they've told you not to think about them for the rest of your lives. But when did you realize that you're going to go look for this child? When did it dawn on you? What was the trigger? nineties. I had lived in this, what I call a fog, because that was the only way I could cope through my life. And, all, and then my daughter, my raised daughter was about 14 or 15 and there were some issues that had surfaced and I went to see a counselor and somehow, I don't know how this counselor knew, she must have sensed it somehow that I had lost a baby to adoption and that's what started me on the path of searching and I looked and I looked and I had a good idea of where to look. Somehow I had a good idea of where to look. And um, I went to the uh, museum in that small community and saw the adoption notice in the paper. And that was the puzzle piece that fit. But it was, and I found her in 1992. But I just started coming out of this fog slowly, slowly, slowly. but it was a real process and it was a painful process. And then I had to tell my children that I raised that I had had this baby and I didn't know how I was gonna do that, but I did it. And they just gave me a hug. So it was coming out of like a fog. Yes. Let, me, let me bring uh, Wendy Rowney into this uh, from the standpoint of the adoptees, this kind of process of trying to find uh, the birth mother. Can you tell me about the experiences uh, that you or others have found in this, how difficult it is, what the challenges are, and are they better today than they were back then? <laughs> um, how long do we have? Um, <laughs> Um, many provinces in, on, in Canada have made changes to adoption disclosure legislation which has allowed both adopted adults and their parents by birth to access limited identifying information about the other person. This has made some changes in terms of how one can go about finding the other, the other, the other party. Um, but any documents you do get are by definition at least 20 years 18 years, um, 19 years 
old. Um, it doesn't come with an address and an invitation to dinner. So the, the, there's, the, there's the mechanics of finding each other. And many people, when they begin this search, many adoptees are very focused on the mechanics. But what they don't realize until they're into this is that there's an emotional side to this as well. And finding your mother or finding your father and finding your brothers and sisters is life altering. <laughs> and it changes your perception of who you are and why you are the way that you are. When I found my mother, so unlike some of the others here, my mother didn't look for me. Um, I found her and she said to me that uh, she knew any daughter of hers would come looking. Um, and she was right. Um, when I found her, I had, I had expected to find someone who looked like me. That was what I had longed for all my life. I only knew about four things about my parents when I was growing up. I knew my mother was of Irish background. I knew that she was in high school. I knew that she loved my father. And I knew that she had long, dark brown hair. Not a lot to form an identity around. Um, so I, I really wanted to find someone who looked like me. When I met her, she didn't look anything like me. But we had a number of similarities that I hadn't anticipated. We liked the same food. We liked the same leisure activities. Um, we had similar um, political ideology. We had the same china in our homes. So these things that it had never occurred to me to think were inherited, it, it turns out they are. I grew up in a loving home where obviously nobody was related to anybody else. I had always thought that people are the way they are because that's just who you are. It had never occurred to me that in many ways people are the way they are because of things that they have inherited from the people that come before them. And when you learn that and when you see that, it changes how you think about yourself and who you are and the person that you want to be. Okay, let me move to Senator Duffy. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for your great courage in coming here and uh, telling us your stories. If you love your baby, you will give your baby up. One of the things that, uh, well, two things. About 40 years ago, I was at a conference. And as sometimes happens in the evening when people are at a conference, they have a few cocktails. And one of the participants there was a very rich, and I'm talking millions of dollars, six foot tall, six foot four tall, big man. And he dominated this conference I was at at this university. And that evening, we got sitting chatting. And he started to cry. And I'm Mike, the reporter, and I'm saying, like, and he was an American. This was in the States. And, like, he didn't know me. And, I, and what's this all about? And he said, do you think I'm any good? And I said, well, you know, you're the keynote speaker. You've made millions of dollars, you employees, thousands of employees. Of course you're good. Why, why would you, you know, you've accomplished so much. Why would you have any doubt about are you any good? And he said, well, one winter day in a little church in Maine, a baby was put in a basket on the church steps. I thought, this is too bizarre to be true. You know, this is like something out of a book. And he said, that little baby was me. And he said, I have no idea where I came from. Why am I six foot three or whatever he was? Why do I, you know, all of this stuff. And that was, you can have all of the success in the world, but if you don't know from where you've come, you're missing a huge chunk of your life. And I didn't know what to say. Uh, you know, gee, that's too bad, whatever. 
One of the good things that's happened since my appointment to the Senate is that now all of a sudden you get people calling you, phoning you, writing you, emailing you, saying, I need some help. I think I've got a connection to PEI. And I need to find my birth parents. And what I've discovered is that PEI is one of the places where it's more difficult, uh, one of the most difficult in Canada, to solve that riddle. Ms. Andrews, you've written about this in the Toronto Star. What's, what can you tell us about not just PEI, but all of the provinces where they still keep this information secret? Thank you for your question. Um, right now, the situation in Canada is that adoption records are what we're calling semi-open in um, uh, eight provinces. Uh, semi-open meaning that uh, an adoptee can file a paper and say, I want to know the identifying information of my mother. And uh, unless there's been a veto placed, then that adoptee would get that information and vice versa with the mother. How would you know which province or do people apply to all of the provinces looking for their parents? It's the province where the adoption took place. So if the adoption took place in Ontario, then you would apply in Ontario and so on and so forth. And there's a lot, as Monica alluded to, difficulties between interprovincial adoptions where one one uh, province will be open, let's say, like Ontario, or semi-open at least, and a closed province like Nova Scotia, if the baby was sent over there, then we can't get the information even though the adoption was, you know, finalized here. Um, so right now we still have Nova Scotia, PEI, and Quebec is still on the edge of uh, trying to open some records there. Um, in terms of PEI specifically, there are huge problems because a lot of um, uh, babies um, left PEI. They were adopted into the states, they were adopted out of the country. Um, a lot of mothers that came to PEI, to the maternity homes in those areas, uh, came from Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, so that in eastern Canada there was a lot of that, so to hide the shame and hide the identity. Within PEI itself, I think my figures, I think there's about 4,500 4, adoptions uh, in that 30-year uh, period. Right now, the situation in PEI particularly that you might be interested in, yeah. Senator Duffy, is that um, there has been a petition put forward to uh, the legislature there. Uh, they're, they're in the process of a public consultation, uh, which I think is just uh, finishing right now. And uh, it is my understanding that draft legislation will be coming forward in the fall uh, session to open the adoption records there. The thing is, though, these vetoes are, although they're, they talk about you know, being able to protect privacy, they're mostly blaming us, the mothers, that we were promised privacy. Well, we weren't promised anything because we were nobody and nothing. Mm -hmm. And But yet, our, we're the ones being used by governments. I see it in the States, I see it all over. While the mothers were given confidentiality. No mother was ever given a paper or anything to say that this was confidential or that she would have that, you know, that kind of promise. Um, but we're, it's always about us. And um, so I w I'm here to say that no, um, I'm not aware of any woman in Canada that was given, they may have been given assurances by social workers of some kind, but certainly not any, you know, legal paper or anything like that. So how can we help? What can we do to help right this terrible wrong? Well, the records need to be, and I know the Australian Senate inquiry did recommend, and you'll hopefully um, be able to speak with them or hear them out tomorrow, uh, that uh, there be transparency in all adoption records, not only the ones held by the provinces, but those held by maternity homes and others, so that people can get their records and um, understand what happened to themselves in order to promote healing. And so I just think the recommendation of transparency in records across the land, there's no downside to open records. Um, it's not, um, wherever they've been uh, opened, there's been no particular downside. They opened in Ontario in 2009 and everyone, oh, the, the sky will fall. Well, the sky didn't fall and everything was fine. And, 
and people are now getting their records within a couple of weeks. So uh, we hope to see the same across the country, and many of us have worked very hard to, um, you know, they've just, they're opening in New Brunswick on April 18th, I believe, um, or April 1st, rather. And um, so that's going to be a big thing that opens up uh, the east as well. Newfoundland's been open for a very long time. So it's just PEI and Nova Scotia now that, and you know, Quebec that are really the sticklers uh, there. And I think there's a lot of secrets there too in terms of a lot of babies left the land and um, uh, you know, the maternity homes and the Catholic system. And there's a lot of horror stories that come out of um, out of that area, unfortunately, like, well, we all know about the Butterbox babies and things like that, so. We worry a lot about Quebec. Yes. I'm sorry? We worry a lot about Quebec okay. because of the difficulty. Well, we're going to have somebody coming in from Quebec, yeah. I Good. think, on It'll Thursday. Be, yeah. Um, Senator uh, Bernard. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, let me start by full disclosure to say that I'm a social worker, retired social work educator who just happens to be a senator. And let me also say for the record that in my practice and teaching of social work, I used to draw a line in the sand. And I'd say there was a group of social workers who saw the practice of social work as being about social control. And then there was a group that saw the practice of social work as being about social justice. Let me assure you that I've been on the side of social justice. But I also want to assure you that um, clearly your, your experiences are all on the side of social control. And so I want to acknowledge uh, the trauma and the pain of your truth, of your experiences. And I want to thank you for coming and sharing with us and, and helping to inform us of uh, your reality. We know of the 60s scoop, and one of you mentioned it, I can't remember who mentioned it. So we know of the 60s scoop, what happened with indigenous children who were placed for adoption. And as, as you folks are speaking, you're telling a, a truth that's been so buried for so many years. Uh, my daughter actually is also a, a social worker, now retired, and her first job was in adoption disclosure in Nova Scotia. In Nova Scotia. So we would, we would have lots of talks about uh, adoption reunions, and it was absolutely wonderful when they worked, not so wonderful when they didn't. And part of the problem was not enough resources to handle, I think, uh, Wendy, you talked about the emotional side of this that really has been uh, not even acknowledged. Clearly, your experiences as mothers who were forced to give up your children, the emotional side of, of that loss was never never discussed with you. So, so I, I um, want to ask a couple of things. I, I guess I'm getting to a question. This is very emotional, actually. <laughs> or two of a single question. So okay, thank you. Thank right you for here. the indulgence. <laughs> thank you. I think I'm the only social worker here, so <laughs> they'll give me a little uh, indulgence here. One of you mentioned the fact that there was high demand, particularly for blonde, blue-eyed babies. And so I'm wondering, in your work, and uh, the work that you've done from your respective uh, organizations and also your personal journeys. Do you know what happened to the babies who weren't blonde and blue-eyed? The babies maybe that looked a bit like me. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, babies of color were in post-war Canada were considered, I have them in some social work files as handicapped, um, and um, many other labels attached to them as unadoptable, unwanted, all kinds of uh, labels attached to um, babies of color. Um, mothers of color were given the resources 
in most cases to mother their babies because their babies were not these, what they used to actually call them blue ribbon babies, the, uh, the white, um, you know, cute little blue-eyed blonde girl babies. And um, unfortunately, um, I always say it's probably the only time in history when a woman of color had a bet, got a better deal because she got the resources to mother her baby because where we were, our babies were valuable, uh, considered valuable, and her baby was considered not valuable. So in light of that, she got the resource to mother. It was really such a system that, um, I mean, some children of color were sent out of the country as far as France. Mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. articles of uh, children being sent to France, United States, to find homes for them. Um, because there, were, there weren't that many babies of color in the system at the time. Uh, Many went, went to foster homes and, of course, were never adopted. Um, but they were labeled unadoptable, and um, for the most part, I think too, for the, from the legacy of slavery, from all of those things, mm -hmm. I think the black community, you know, surrounded those mothers more than maybe, you know, our community did for us. Um, I mean, that's basically what my research is showing. Senator, you had a further question? N no, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll come back on all round right. two. Okay. If there's a round two. Yeah, uh, sure. Well, I hope so. Uh, we'll see. Uh, see how the time goes. Uh, Senator Poitier. Uh, thank you, Chair. I actually have to say I'm shocked uh, to hear a lot of what you've been saying, and I really want to thank you for sharing uh, this emotional um, stories that you have with us. And I'm very grateful that uh, that shameful practice has been stopped. Uh, and that at least we're not doing with that anymore uh, today as we as, as women. Um, from my understanding, from what I've heard, is it's not even was not even only done in Canada. It was done in, in other countries too, uh, in uh, uh, Australia, as you talked a while ago, in New Zealand, UK, United States, and, and in different uh, different areas. And if I'm understanding right, it seemed it like it was organized and. Um, controlled by churches and, and, and governments, provincial and federal, um, at, at all levels uh, in that time. So I guess I'm asking is, what justification has government offered, if any at all, at this point on the practice, the shameful practice that had happened then? Uh, and at, have you had a chance to meet with the cabinet members or the, the MPs of the existing governments of today to, to begin a dialogue uh, on this shameful practice and, and where can we go from here forward? Anyone that feels like they want to answer can, can answer. Okay. Do you want to start, Valerie and Andrews? Um, yes, we have met. We've had many meetings up here on the Hill. Um, the last one we had, I think, was in this room last year. We had about 50 MPs and some senators and a member from the um, Prime Minister's office, two representatives, uh, where we um, showed, um, you know, I think I did a PowerPoint showing the maternity homes, the women in the homes, um, from my research and showing images are good, you know, because people can see the women right there. And uh, we've had a lot of support from MPs and MPPs. Um, you know, for this issue, and every time we, we come, and every time we, everybody's well on board and understands what happened back then, and understands it was, in many cases, illegal acts, unethical for sure, particularly in social work, and as you're, you're seeing on that side of social control. And um, certainly, um, there were human rights abuses. I mean, we had women sexually abused in maternity homes, like where the priest would come to give the girls their weekly, you know, communion and, you know, fondling women there. Um, there's like, 
you know, it goes back to all of these old institutions, you know, that we had in Canada. And maternity homes, you yeah. haven't heard about them because we were silenced. It's secretive. It was, you know, it's a secret knowledge. Um, you know, we're, we were told to be quiet, not tell. So that's why I think, you know, people are just learning about it. Now we're, you know, we're getting up there and we're, we're saying, well, we need to, we need to tell now. We've got to tell about this now. So. I understand that um, the Australian government has um, given an apology, if I, if I understand right. Um, following what has happened in Australia, is there something different um, that you would like to see or something more than that you would like to see the Canadian government do um, than has been done in Australia? Is there anything else that you would like to, to share with us that you as a group would like to see happen? Well, they did a pretty good job. I mean, I think the Women's of Origins Australia were extremely pleased and had a lot of input into um, the wording of the apology. The other things they did, they did permanent, um, they've got a permanent yeah. installation at the, uh, the archives, they've got, um, they did uh, money, f you know, funding for mental health issues. They, the recommendations that uh, were put out by that inquiry were for the most part actually, um, you know, they did uh, uh, go through with them and, and we were actually very pleased with uh, the way it was handled and I mean you're not you're not always pleased with what governments are doing and and as a group we were in general very pleased because they also uh, named it as some of the practices as illegal it was named in the apology and um, if you ever get an opportunity to look at that apology the first five minutes of it you'll 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 see the emotion of it it's um it was given by uh, Julia Gillard when she was Prime Minister Thank you. My heart goes really out to you all, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing what you did today. Thanks. Anybody else want to follow up on that? I, I do have, I, I want to pick up on that and ask you one other question because, uh, Valerie Anders, in your comments, you said that 95% uh, of the children that were in the maternity homes uh, were put up for adoption, whereas today, adoption is about 2%. So obviously, things have changed. Uh, uh, is there any lingering of the old practices or is it pretty much all different now? And what is different? Well, that's a really good question because the, before the adoption mandate, um, maternity homes actually were mother baby homes. Babies were in those homes and you'll see in your package, you'll see a picture of some of those homes with the, the cribs right there in the homes. And what happened was when the you know, mother imperative and all these other things that came together and the babies were out of the homes and this clean break came in. And even today, most of the adoption practices of today are informed by the mandate. The clean break, the, um, the bonding, when they have adoptive parents in delivery rooms and a lot of the practices are still informed by the mandate. They're different. Um, from the mandate. When we see young women, um, I think young middle class women are not choosing adoption per se. They may be choosing abortion or maybe choosing to mother more than they're choosing adoption. Um, so I think that's one of the changes, certainly. And we're not hiding away these, these, these young girls. You know, we're not putting them in, you know, isolation and in quasi incarceral settings where they're being, you know, um, really programmed to, to do a certain thing. So I think that's a big change. Okay. Uh, and again, anybody else wants to jump in any time, put your hand up, please. Senator Munson is the next. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, it is emotional testimony, but we, we can't erase the past, but we can talk about the present and the future, and I'd like to follow up on Senator Poirier's. I don't think there's been a specific answer to that. Should this government and provincial governments today apologize and religious organizations who have been part of this whole process apologize publicly, and should there be reparations uh, involved in this? 
can't erase the past, but we can help uh, give light to the future. <laughs> I know Valerie's going to answer, but does anybody else want to uh, start an answer just to engage everybody else in this conversation? Yeah, and you can defer to Valerie if you want. Okay. Uh, yes. And an apology would be wonderful. And funding for um, mental health professionals and for mothers, because we have mothers that have a hard time uh, providing for for therapy for themselves because certain types of therapy are very expensive. One of the therapies that um, is sort of the um, golden standard is called EMDR, and um, it's just not affordable for many people. And uh, so funding would be a big thing. It's a type of therapy that takes you back to the situation oh. and and then redefines <coughs> it for your for you re rework reworks it. Okay. It's very effective. Monica Byrne, um, then uh, Wendy Rowney, and I'll come back to Valerie. One of the places that I feel really sad about are the schools of social work. Very few social workers have any training in adoption reunion. And so we get, at the volunteer sector, in the, you know, we get inundated with people who have, who have nowhere else to go but to the volunteer sector, where I, you know, a housewife in my early 70s, am trying to support them. There are very few therapists who understand the issues of adoption, all sorts of issues, post-adoption, pre-adopt, pre-reunion, post-reunion. There's all sorts of stuff. And there are a lot of psychologists. I tell everyone, if you're going to a therapist, for heaven's sake, interview him or her first. Find out if they know anything about the subject of what you're going to embark on, uh, you know, because it's it's not well covered. So uh, education is a very important factor. I used to go to Carleton University. I had a, uh, a new someone in uh, the School of Social Work, and I'd go and do a thing every year on at least search and reunion. You know what it's about. Why would you want to do it? What's the, you know what, is, what does it entail? Wendy Rowney. is recognition. Recognition that this is something that happened. Recognition that in slightly different format continues to happen. And recognition that whether you're a mother, whether you're a father who surrendered a child to adoption, and we haven't talked much about them, but they were systematically excluded from the process in the years that we're talking about, even when the mother, when the, when the parents were a couple and the father wanted to be involved, he was usually not allowed to be. Um, so whether you're a mother, whether you're a father, or whether you're the adoptee, this is something that impacts our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. In some ways, the, for many adoptees, there have been great benefits, but those benefits need to be balanced with the great losses that every adoptee experiences. And we need to have recognition that this is something that impacts people's lives. Part of that recognition is allowing and not allowing, is recognizing people's right to know each other. We're not a special breed of person. We don't need special laws that are created for our own protection. I don't need a law that tells me who it is I can or cannot know, particularly then when that person is someone who gave birth to me doesn't mean I'm going to have a great relationship with her, doesn't mean I'm going to have a relationship at all. All that it means is that there's a recognition on the part of Canada that all people have a right to know who they are and that parents have a right to know who their children are. Well said. Okay, uh, uh, sorry, Sandra, sorry. and then I'll finish with uh, Valerie on this question. I think the importance of an apology, too, is that all our sons and daughters know 
they were wanted because of what has come out of that is that they were abandoned by us, and that isn't the truth. And I think that's important in the apology that they and for their lives as well. <laughs> and Valerie Andrews, did you have something to? Yeah, yeah I was just going to say about <coughs> you know the, from the qu the question: Should this government? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, uh, one hundred percent. They should. They should acknowledge it, validate that these things took place. Um, you know, reparations could be in any form. You know, the mothers that I spoke to, I said, "What do you want?" We did a poll. What do you want? You know, from churches and government, and and I think Wendy really hit it. Most of them want acknowledgement and validation because these are such shocking things. When we people sometimes just don't even believe that these things actually took place and they really did and so that's why we do the research to prove it did that's why we you know we we use the Australian um, you know Senate inquiry to, to give that the credibility that it did happen and so yes uh, the acknowledgement of the, the, the validation and certainly reparations for mothers I, I don't know any mothers who are specifically looking for money but they're certainly looking for um, help with mental health issues, certainly. That's one of the things that we hear a lot, um, you know, for this kind of uh, trauma therapy, um, EMDR or other kinds of trauma therapy that are available out there. So, so I say yes, this government should act the way Australia acted. And just for okay. specific, I just well, want to know, very, just very quickly, want to know how I'm getting mothers, other hands here, just a minute. How um, many mothers are we No, Senator here? Munson, hold on. I'm getting other hands here. If anybody wants to go down for a second round, uh, I have I have Senator Dean comes next, and then I have Senator uh, Petty Clare, Bernard, and Senator Duffy then on a and Senator Poirier on a second round. You, okay, Senator Munson, you had one quick question. How many with. mothers are we talking about? That we we, we we do residential schools survivors. survivors yes, and, and uh, that's a good point, Mike. Mm -hmm. But. When we talk about residential schools and the apology, we, we have numbers, so I, right. I, I like to have numbers, that's all. Well, my research shows that between 1940 and 1970 in Canada, over 300,000 mothers were impacted by these policies and practices that were illegal, unethical, and human rights abuses. That does not mean that 300,000 women uh, agree that they, you know, some women say, oh, I did that and I think that was best for, for my baby. We can't, uh, you know, say all, but we do know that 300,000 women were impacted by the policies and um, those children were adopted. I mean, those children were adopted. Those are the adoption numbers from 1940 to 1970 in Canada. Um, from unmarried mothers, and, and uh, many provinces broke out those numbers, Senator Munson, like separately. So if you go into the Ontario records, you can say adoptions, adoptions from unmarried mothers. So you can just go in year by year and add them up. Okay. Senator Dean. Thank you. Just to follow up at the end of this first round on, on the theme of, of questions, and I, I Look, I, I first of all want to add my voice to that of my colleagues that to to come here and share these stories with us is is I'm sure it's painful. I hope it's cathartic, but but these are tough stories to listen to, and and it's so important that we have both mothers and and a, and a daughter here. <laughs> um, we've heard the personal stories, and and, and they are painful and dramatic, and, and we've also heard um, from from you, uh, Valerie, a, a contextual story, that that this was that this was contextual, it was in the context of, of a particular post-war period, it, it, it was historically specific, although perhaps not unusual at the time, that it was part morality, driven by morality, part driven by religion. As Senator Seidman asked, was it systemic? It seems to have been systemic for all of, of, of those reasons. Um, it was certainly uh, unethical, and we've heard it that it may have gone considerably beyond that. Um, we, we, we hear about the importance of an acknowledgement. Uh, we hear about the importance, hear you loud and clear about the, the importance of support in terms of uh, 
um, supporting those affected in living with the outcomes of, 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 of these practices. We, we will be listening to um, our Australian colleagues and that will be important and, and we hear you when you say that we should listen to them. I just want to follow up on the, the, the notion of an apology and an apology that's inclusive. And, and we can certainly learn from our, our Australian colleagues about how they, what steps they took to make that apology inclusive. But while you're here, and because things are culturally specific and personally specific, it, we, it would be important for us to know what inclusivity means to you. And, and if, that, if, 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 if you're not ready to provide that advice, we, we'd, we'd want to and we'd invite you to, to, to provide it to us later because that seems to be vitally important in situations of this sort and we're hearing that it's very important to you. So, you know, just in terms of what, what would inclusivity feel like? All right, if you, you can always respond to that later if you wish. Uh, any, that's it, Senator Dean? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let me go to the second round now, uh, starting with Senator Petit Claire. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chair. The question I had when I put my name has been uh, mostly answered, and, and, and I, was, I was concerned on, you know, the wrong that was historically made not being recognized when it comes to caring and healing. And I think you expressed that it, it is not, you know, the healing process and the support that you need uh, for that healing process, whether it is funding or, or just plain recognition of this specific trauma, it's, it's not happening. Um, the way that that I believe it, it should be. So I, I'm out. So that that was my question. But you know, I think you've pretty much answered it. So maybe if you just want to just say if I'm right in assuming that, um, and maybe because we haven't talked about it, and just to have it uh, on the record, what is your um, impression on um, on on the fathers in, in that whole situation? Or is it something that is completely separate that you don't really have that conversation uh, in the groups that you represent? Or are they organized or are they just not? Because um, we haven't really read about no matter what happened, you know, if they disappeared as I've read in some uh, uh, testimony, but I'm sure uh, there is some sort of uh, consequences to that as well for them. So. Um, I don't know if it is uh, something that you can answer. In, in my experience, mm -hmm. uh, birth fathers were not informed often. They didn't know they were birth fathers. Okay. Mm -hmm. When the mothers put the father, if the mother was single and she put the father's name on the birth registration, it was expunged in Ontario. It was removed and she was not permitted to name a birth father if she was a single woman. If she was married, her husband's name automatically was on that document, even if he wasn't the father. Because any child born to a married woman at a certain time in, you know, in those years was automatically her husband's child. Who, who else would it be? Um, <laughs> And, uh, the, which we have always complained about, the expunging of information from a legal document that was signed and stamped. Just for me, uh, that to me is highly irregular. Mm -hmm. uh, we have difficulty with fathers because they were systematically excluded from many of the, these discussions. Many didn't turn up. They were always called on the, on the documents the, P, the, the PF, the putative father, because the mother gave information. So when you get these old backgrounds, they say the PF was not, it didn't turn up, didn't come to the meeting. All the information we have is from the mother. 
these fathers were uh, encouraged not to attend, and the mother was encouraged not to involve him in any way. I married the birth father much later. My husband went, he was at university in Nova Scotia at the time, he went to the social services there to tell them that his girlfriend was pregnant and what should he do. And he was told by the good social worker who was a nun that it was not his affair, it was not his business, it was my problem, and that he should keep out of it. And that was the end of the story. He did come back because I lived in Ottawa and he went with me to social services. All his information was given to the social worker at the time. When he applied to Thunder Bay to Vital Statistics to get the registration of our daughter's birth, the new amended one, his name, he was uh, refused it because he had never been offered the document to sign as uh, the registration of birth. So these fathers are not part of the story very much, only because they were kept away. Thank you. Yeah, Wendy Rani, please. Thank you. I've been talking with a lot of fathers recently, and in many ways their stories mirror that of mothers, young mothers, in that they felt very powerless, they felt uh, they, were, they were excluded, and they felt excluded from the system. They weren't sure what to do. I mean, really, if we think about it, how many 17, 18-year-old boys are going to stand up to or know the questions to ask? To, to figure out what their rights were in that situation. Yeah. Um, many of them speak of feeling over the years um, emasculated because they were unable to protect their child and the woman they loved. And in our society, certainly in those years, that was perceived to be a man's role. And because they were unable to do that at a very difficult time in their lives, they've continued for 40, 50, 60 years to feel that they themselves are a very unworthy individual and, an, uh, and, 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 and not a contributing member of society. Most of them have been very silent for most all of these decades um, because it's very embarrassing. And they're also, some of them, embarrassed that they didn't stand up that they didn't come forward and protect their girlfriends. The women here are talking about how there was an absence of choice for them. There was also an absence of choice for the, for the fathers. In order for something to be a choice, you have to be able to choose between two things. When there's nothing to choose between, something is not a choice, it is, it's just something that happens to you. Yet they felt that they ought to have done something differently than they did, even though at the time, there was no other avenue open to them. As a result of this, they've been even more reluctant than mothers to come forward to support groups to seek out information. And if they try to find information about their child, as Monica was saying, they often can't because their names are not on the original birth certificates, which means that the government and the children's aid societies will not recognize their right to information. Okay, let me go to uh, send it. We're getting close on uh, our nine o'clock deadline. So, Senator Bernard, you have a further question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to come back to the statement, uh, Ms. Andrews, I think you made uh, earlier in response to a question I was asking. You said that racialized mothers got the resources to mother. And I don't know if your research extended to Nova Scotia. Yes. But certainly with the racialized mothers and children and adults, adoptees and foster children that I've worked with over the years, they would see that differently. Okay. So I'm wondering if you could just say, say a bit more about that, please. Yes. And um, also, if I just could add to that, how will mixed race children see? Yes. So children who may have been born to a white mother, for example, and mm -hmm. a black father. Oh, yes. Um, I think. I, you know, what I was trying to say was we're talking, the period that I'm talking about is mostly, say, 40s to 60s, so I don't know what, um, you know, cohort that, that you're working with. Um, and, of course, I do, I have done some research in Nova Scotia, and I've been aware um, there was a private, um, you know, most of these homes for unwed mothers had, uh, you know, they were, they were, um, 
pretty well filled with uh, middle class, um, you know, white girls. And if you look at the demographics of those homes at the time, and if you ask any of the mothers that were there, there were no women of color in these homes. Now, in Nova Scotia, we did have um, a couple of private homes, to my knowledge. Of ma I'm talking maternity homes now, like in the 60s. Um, there were some private homes. Um, now, of course, we know that you know the uh, child welfare system is extremely racialized, and we know that those children and indigenous children represent, you know, huge numbers in the system. And and you know, at that time in Canada too, um, in other provinces, not so much Nova Scotia, of course, um, you know, the um, black population was uh, not as high. But I do know that. Um, from the research that I've seen is that, that they were at least not uh, maybe a coerced the way, the way we were because they weren't in those homes and they weren't put in that system to um, surrender their children for adoption. Did you find that, or did you find that they were? Yes, yes. Okay, that's I've very interesting to me. Yes, the association of- In the same period? Uh, certainly the 60s, 50s, late okay. 50s. The That's Association really of Black Social me. Workers. Yeah. Are you familiar with that organization? Which one? The Association of Black Social Workers. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I'm one of the founding members of that organization. I know that. <laughs> okay. and, and I know that also in the States, um, the black social workers in the States were actually wanting... Um, well, why don't we have maternity homes for the black women, right? They wanted the same thing. Um, unfortunately, they weren't places where you wanted to, for people to be, unfortunately, because you would lose your baby if you were in such a home. So, um, but I'll certainly, I'm certainly very open to looking at that more, and um, I'm certainly no expert on Nova Scotia, um, you know, um, uh, social welfare systems. Um, but my research did not bring that up. In fact, I had, um, uh, one piece of research that uh, it was a government document from Nova Scotia that said they were um, surprised uh, to find that there was, um, you know, the wording was something like we were surprised to find that there was um, in, in the wording of the time um, uh, an, a Negro girl in the home. And so that was brought out in the government reports. Mm -hmm. So it seemed to be an anomaly to me, but maybe my research is, is, is limited and I just found one or two things. So, and those are the kinds of things I found, so. Yes. yes. Let me uh, uh, move on to, we have two more questions and I'm gonna ask that they put the questions first and then we'll get the answers uh, from the panel. So Senator Poirier and then Senator Duffy. Okay, any questions, uh, two please? short ones and I'll combine them into one. Uh, the first one, I know that we talked about uh, looking for an apology recognition from the government um, in, in the practice that was going on in, in those years. I'm just wondering, have you approached the churches uh, for the same kind of recognition? Uh, and the second little part of the question was, uh, I was just wondering, in all the mothers that this has happened to, do you have an idea of how many have been able to reunite uh, with their son or daughter so that they have found? Okay, while you're thinking of the answer to that, Senator Duffy's question. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of our witnesses tonight. And I think part of what we've learned here, and hopefully through CPAC, which will broadcast this meeting, uh, people who have been uh, adoptees and mothers who have not met their children, I hope will have learned from this that the amount of shame, I had two people call my office uh, who reached out and spoke to the birth mother and were rejected. And what we've heard here tonight gives us a deeper appreciation, and I hope those adoptees across the country, a deeper appreciation of the shame that was put on their mothers by the institutions and which they carry with them to this day. And as I believe in, in these two young people who called me, I suspect that's, that shame was the reason for their rejection because the birth mother was not, had been deeply damaged and was not able to come to grips. So it underscores the point 
that you're making here and which this committee has been so sympathetic to? The question then, uh, Senator Poirier, is a two-part question. Uh, responses? Answer, uh, Senator Duffy's. Oh, you can answer him too, sure. Just very briefly. I didn't think he had a question, but he had a comment. No. <laughs> very briefly then, I just did two reunions with two 91-year-old mothers. Both the mothers had declared they did not wish to be contacted through their uh, provincial social services because, A, they're, grown, they're kids. Now, these are 91-year-old mothers. Their kids didn't know. The kids were in their 70s. And uh, in, nevertheless, the two adoptees found these two mothers separately and contacted them. And both the mothers said, oh, so glad you found me. Just don't tell the kids. I don't want them to know. The shame had followed them till they were 91. Wow. There, you know, so yes, these there are reasons why mothers refuse contact, and it's not because they don't like their children or love their children. I don't want to lose sight of uh, uh, Senator Poirier's questions. Uh, uh, one was, are, are you? You've said what you want from government. What about the churches? Uh, we do have one of the churches coming on Thursday, okay. the United Church. Uh, and uh, the second question was, what what number or what percentage of the of the people that you've been in contact with actually do connect? Go ahead and do that. I don't know. Okay, and Valerie Andrews. the churches, um, Origins Canada um, had a historic meeting with um, mothers as a panel similar to this with the Presbyterian Salvation Army, Catholic, United, okay. and, Presby um, Anglican. and Anglican churches, um, who all sent representatives, very top level representatives, to our meeting to listen to the stories of the mothers. And we had mothers that represented those religions who had been in their maternity homes. And, um, you know, the churches have been, you know, very good in terms of listening, but not so much in terms of doing. And uh, with the exception of the United Church, which has, um, you know, actually put quite a few things together for us and at least, you know, has been working with us and has been um, acknowledging and validating these things with us. Um, so yes, we have reached out to the churches. We're very disappointed that um, the churches that were contacted to come to the study, except with the exception of the United Church, uh, declined to to be here. Uh, yes. I and might also add that the federal and the provincial governments contacted also declined. So, but we will have the Ontario Children's Aid Society. We'll have uh, from Quebec the. Uh, we move on to Ray to VI uh, coming on uh, on Thursday, and tomorrow will be Australia. I just just before I thank uh, our our witnesses, I want to committee members point out that I will be putting a motion before the Senate. Uh, bill C45, the cannabis bill, will occupy a lot of our time for the next couple of months uh, after we finish this uh, subject. Uh, and we're going to need some special meetings, and so I will put a motion before the Senate. You've heard of these motions many times, uh, asking us to meet, notwithstanding that the Senate may be meeting at some times. We're, we're looking at a couple of uh, Monday meeting prospects and a couple of extensions of the Wednesday and Thursday meetings by an additional hour to be able to get through uh, all of the considerations of Bill C-45. About oh, you number. didn't answer the second part. That's no. true. Okay, you got one minute. <laughs> I don't think we do know that. We have no idea. As I said, uh, we hear from people and they ask a million questions. They go away and they do their own thing and we never know. And sometimes I'll chase them down and say whatever happened. But I, I, I do that all the time and I'm going back 25, 30 years and I'm phoning them. And, oh, yes, I found my daughter 10 years ago. Oh, thanks for letting me know. Okay. So the well, file is still open yes. in my drawer. Well, let me tell you, the five of you have been absolutely uh, a great value to us in considering of this matter. You've, you've, you've told us personal stories. You've t told us a lot, of, about a lot of different research you've done. A lot, it, it's been very valuable as uh, we start this uh, study. So we're back at it again tomorrow at 4.15. Uh, we'll have uh, Australia particularly uh, involved tomorrow. And with that, the meeting is adjourned.